Hey there, everyone. Uh, we are gathered today to talk about emission controls. Okay, so we are gonna talk about a few things, the composition of air, that way we know what it is that we're cleaning up and why the regulated emissions and where they come from. We'll talk about each one. Um, we're also gonna talk about how each one of those emissions is controlled in the vehicle and the functions of each of the emission controls in our uh, emission control system. We're gonna talk about the difference between pre-combustion, post-combustion controls, as well as fuel evap. So first things first, what are emissions? Um, just in general, Oops, let me get this out of the way here. So in general, what are emissions? When we hear that term, I think we all think of the same thing. Emissions means bad gases that need to get cleaned up, right? They're the release of substances into the atmosphere uh, that are not necessarily a good thing and we need to clean up. So when we talk about emissions, we're talking about the byproduct of combustion. We know these as tailpipe emissions. So when you see smoke come out of the tailpipe, I know that's what you think. Not all emissions produce a smoke, uh, just so we're all aware of that. Now, back in the 70s, when all this really started, 60s and 70s, um, and we decided we needed to manage those emissions. So I'll talk about more uh, in a few slides here about a little bit of that legislative history. But uh, before we get into that, we can talk about how we manage the emissions. So how do we, how do we make the, the amount lower or the number of emissions lower? We manage them through a few things. Engine design, uh, air fuel ratio is probably one of the biggest ones for sure. And then another way we get rid of them uh, is by cleaning them up through various ways. So we try our best to really just make sure that we produce as little as possible, and that's where the engine design and air fuel ratio come in. And then after we have already produced some of them, how do we clean them up? So the air we actually breathe uh, daily is going to comprise of just, uh, well, mainly three. Um, well, not three, cut that out. The air we breathe is going to consist of mainly nitrogen, which most of us think oxygen, but that's not necessarily the case. Nitrogen is roughly around 70% of the air that we breathe. In nitrogen, it happens to be an inert gas. Now, this is going to be a really important term that we're going to talk more about later when we get into EGRs, but inert gases, or the term inert, means that that, that uh, substance is not... Uh, active or it's not going to react. Um, we're going to talk more about that later. Uh, 21 or around 21% of our air is going to be oxygen, which is highly reactive, the opposite of inert. Um, oxygen likes to burn very well. And then about 1% is going to be miscellaneous elements that are floating around like carbon dioxide, argon. Um, this right here, oh, this doesn't work. So our legislative history, um, as we go back, we go to the 60s where the Clean Air Act um, started. Uh, we started looking at tailpipe and underhood inspections. Uh, then we moved into the California IM240, which is the clean emissions test. This one's gonna be a dyno test uh, at different speeds. And there is a sniffer that goes up the tailpipe, and it's also going to consist of an underhood visual inspection. Uh, you can see here on the left, it talks about the different emissions, HCs and COs. We'll talk more about that in a few. But how much we're allowed and how much we actually have. Um, and it does require the use of a vehicle and a dyno because if the vehicle is driving around, it's hard to keep track of what's coming out of the tailpipe. Um, if you're not familiar with the dynamometer, it is essentially uh, drums that roll in the ground that allow the vehicle to act like it's running, the wheel's spinning, but it's not going anywhere. Um, and then currently we use what we call the FTP drive cycle. So uh, we'll get into that in this slide here. Sorry for all of the writing, but uh, as far as regulated emissions, uh, manufacturers are required by the law 
uh, and the uh, Environmental Protection Agency to control emissions produced by the vehicles. We utilize OBD2 for a lot of this. Monitors is really the big thing here, um, and we will talk more about monitors later. But through uh, OBD2 monitors, we are able to constantly uh, make sure all of our emission controls are working properly. Now, I did mention that currently we use the FTP, which happens to be the Federal uh, Test Procedure Drive Cycle Test. Um, we don't necessarily need the sniffer anymore, uh, but it's going to determine the emission output of a vehicle. Um, it is classified by year, make, and model, as well as drivetrain. And what it's using, and this is utilizing OBD2 monitors, is the smog technician will simply plug in a scan tool, make sure that all of your emission OBD monitors have been met. And if they have been met, then that means everything's working properly. There's really no reason to be checking anything else because uh, the computer says, hey, all these monitors are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, monitors are monitoring a system. Remember when we talked about engine management, or even back when we talked about OBD2, monitors are going to monitor or watch a whole system, something like fuel evap um, or secondary air, whatever it might be, uh, and it's going to monitor, okay, at this RPM, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Okay, am I getting a reaction at this solenoid? Are these levels proper? And if they are, it will pass a monitor. If the monitor has failed, it will show that it has not passed the monitor, um, or not only that it has not passed, but that it has, it has failed. Now, if the monitor maybe is still taking place, because some, some monitors um, can take a really, really long time to pass, so uh, it, it will just say that it's still, um, it, it is still working or that it is, uh, the monitor has not passed yet, but it won't say that it has failed. Now, unless it has passed, it, the vehicle will not pass smog. And so if your vehicle battery has been disconnected or codes have been cleared, all the monitor information will be erased. So just keep that in mind. If you just cleared codes and you're thinking you're gonna be sly taking it to the uh, smog shop, they're gonna see it right away and you're just gonna waste your time and theirs. So uh, you need to make sure that all your monitors have passed before you go to take it to get smogged, that way you don't waste your time. <clears throat> so uh, like I said, under FTV drive cycle, we've got to certify mission output of vehicles and ensure they meet regulatory standards using monitors. Um, sorry, down here, it looks like we've got it cut off on our screen, but it says vehicles must pass the test before they can be sold and must be capable of detecting an emission failure over their life. And that's what the monitors are for. If the monitors aren't working, it will show. Um, there's really no way to trick that yet. Um, maybe if you know a way, then message me and uh, that'd be cool to know. But so far, you can't really fake these monitors. If you remove the system or anything like that, it will show uh, and you, you won't be able to pass smog. So uh, just keep that in mind. And that little bit at the bottom is in quotations because that legally, before you sell a vehicle, you're supposed to make sure that it passes smog and all that good stuff. So what are the emissions we've been talking about this whole time? So there are non-harmful emissions. Um, I didn't mention that emissions are simply a byproduct coming out of the tailpipe, but not all of them are bad. Uh, a lot of them are bad or a good chunk of them are, but some of them are not. One of the non-harmful emissions is water, also known as H2O, right? Um, this is actually super common uh, as it is a result of complete combustion. So way, way back in the day, it was not really common to see water coming out of the tailpipe. And if you did, it was a blown head gasket. Nowadays, it's super common. Most all vehicles are gonna have some sort of water coming out of the tailpipe because of complete combustion, either from the engine, uh, but more so from the catalytic converter as well. Um, and we're able to do that. You can see here, we've got hydrogen, oxygen, another hydrogen. When we get full combustion, the hydrogen wants to bind with that oxygen. Um, we also have nitrogen and oxygen, hence they are in our air. So of course they are going to uh, be in our emission. Now the harmful emissions that you guys are gonna hear over and over again, and these are the three big ones. I've got some more for you though. Um, 
The three big ones are going to be CO, first off, uh, carbon monoxide, which happens to be a result of incomplete combustion. So some combustion happened, but it didn't go all the way through uh, of carbon and oxygen and they tend to bind, but just the one oxygen makes it dangerous. This happens from rich uh, air fuel mixtures or too much fuel in an air fuel mixture. Um, carbon monoxide is probably one of the big famous ones because it is deadly, it is toxic to your body. Um, and the scary thing is, is that carbon monoxide uh, is invisible. It is scentless, you can't smell it, and it is tasteless, you can't taste it. Um, if you can't see, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, you have no idea when there's way too much of it around you. And this one could uh, kill you if, if, if in high enough concentration. Uh, hydrocarbons, or HCs, again, another one we're gonna talk a lot about, is simply raw fuel. <laughs> now, HC emissions are going to be a fuel vapor. So when the raw fuel itself, the liquid starts to evaporate, uh, those are our hydrocarbon emissions. So if you had a fuel leak, you would have hydrocarbon emissions leaking out. Um, if there was fuel on the ground, eventually it would evaporate. Those hydrocarbons would, uh, would float up. Um, this is not good for our atmosphere. This also happens from rich air fuel mixtures. Um, again, now, the last one is, uh, it's NOx, but it's not nitrous oxide, so please don't get those confused. It is oxides of nitrogen, two very different things. This one is a little bit different because it is from lean air fuel mixtures, not enough fuel, uh, and it really comes from high combustion temperatures and high pressures. Now, this one is a harmful gas as well to our atmosphere. Um, so this one's not a good one either. Now there's other harmful ones that are not near as famous, but sulfur dioxide is a big one. Now you don't, it, it is semi-famous, uh, but you don't know the name of it, right? Many of you are probably not familiar with sulfur dioxide. Uh, this happens to come from excess sulfur from the fuel or oil, but what you know it as is acid rain, right? So what happens is the sulfur dioxide binds to water vapor and it creates acid rain. So sulfur dioxide is a harmful uh, emission. Uh, many of you might be familiar with particulates. This one is a really common one from diesels or even gasoline direct, direct injection uh, have definitely large issues with particulates. Um, these are going to be like those soot black carbon particles uh, so when you see somebody rolling coal, they're throwing out a whole bunch of particulates. This is going to be a result of rich air fuel mixture or a poorly mixed air fuel mixture, which is can, can be common. Uh, carbon dioxide. So a lot of you guys are familiar with this one, probably CO2. Uh, this one's not near as harmful. However, the EPA has labeled carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, so it does assist in uh, global warming. It has helped raise temperatures, and so it's become a problem for us. Um, it does happen to be a product of complete combustion as well, so this one's really hard to, to sort of get around. What we do need to try to do is possibly separate, uh, separate these elements here. Now there's a, quite a few vehicle classifications that might be familiar if you've seen them on stickers on vehicles. They're all over the place. Um, you don't see TLEV anymore. Those, uh, th those are actually pretty outdated. But transitional low emission vehicles is sort of where it started. Then it went to low emission vehicles. Uh, then ultra low emission vehicles, and then they, I guess they couldn't get more creative, so they went to super ultra low emission vehicles, so the cleaner they got, and now you'll notice it says partial zero emission vehicle, uh, all the way to zero emission vehicle. Now, there is really no such thing as a ZEV, and some of you might be thinking, well, what about an electric vehicle, like, a, like an EV, right? Even those have some emissions. They might not be from combustion, so it could be ZEV from combustion. However, there's other things on the vehicle like adhesives and paint that, uh, and plastics and, and things like that that are going to release small amounts of emissions coming from the vehicle. So there really is no such thing uh, at all as a ZEV. 
Now, uh, in our vehicles, we have emission control systems, which is why we're talking about this at all. Um, we know it's to reduce the amount of those emissions that we're producing, right, or at least those harmful pollutants. Um, and the three ones that our emission control systems really focus mainly on uh, in gasoline vehicles and diesel vehicles, they do focus on particulates as well. But the three pollutants that we focus on in gasoline vehicles are hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and oxides of nitrogen. Now, the three types of emission controls are going to fall under one of three categories. So either going to fall under pre-combustion controls, meaning um, we're trying to do something before we ignite the air-fuel mixture so we are able to um, prevent the emissions from happening. Then it goes into a category of post-combustion controls. Okay, we've already made the mess, now how do we clean it up? All the way to evaporative controls. Evaporative controls are, I mean, you can almost consider it pre-combustion, but essentially it's focusing mainly on the raw fuel that we store in the vehicle. So let's talk about pre-combustion controls first. Pre-combustion controls are gonna consist of quite a few components. It's probably the largest category of all of them. Let's start off with the PCV system, because this one is in every single vehicle that you're gonna drive. Um, we've been using PCV systems since 1961, um, and it started off really because it increases engine life, um, but it is also going to help the emissions that are put out uh, of the engine. So the PCV system, I think before we explain it, I think it's really important to explain the term, uh, and it's in quotations here, blow by. So we're cleaning up blow by gases. What the heck are blow by gases? So if we look at this engine here, um, if you're following my mouse, we've got an intake, I can tell because my, this is my throttle plate here, going to my intake valve. We're not gonna pay attention to all this excess stuff yet. Uh, as my air and fuel enter in the combustion chamber through the open intake valve, we then squeeze it and then we blow it up. I'm gonna stop right there because when we blow it up, we are, again, I, I kind of, I don't tell the whole story when I'm explaining certain things, especially like the four-stroke cycle, uh, because there are little extra things that happen. We do like to think that all of the energy that we blew up is staying in that combustion chamber until it gets pulled, uh, pushed out of the exhaust, right? Not the case. The majority of it, yes, but some of those combustion pressures do happen to leak past the piston. Um, and this is normal. Now, as an engine wears out, more and more of these, these blow-by gases from combustion leak past our piston rings. Here's the problem. Those blow-by gases from combustion leak into the crankcase. And two bad things happen when this, when this happens. So first off, those combustion gases are actually really acidic. Uh, they contain fuel, hydrocarbons, um, things like that and they are going to hang out where your oil hangs out. And the problem with this is it actually decreases the life of your engine oil and it will make it more acidic. But more than that, uh, we're also pressurizing our crankcase here is what we call this area below the piston. This whole crankcase is starting to get ballooned up because more pressure keeps coming in and coming in and coming in. So, if we don't do anything about those blow by gases, we pressurize our crankcase so much that every seal down there starts to blow out. Our front crank seal, our rear main seal, our oil pan gasket, stuff like that because it's pressurized and so it needs to release somewhere. So if you're starting to find oil leaks all over the place, one by what you're chasing them over and over again, or you're like, man, I just changed that front crank seal and it's leaking again. Um, check your PCV system first. Uh, so what our PCV system is, it takes those blow by gases and uh, it helps release them. You can see uh, we've got blow by gases that are coming through um, on the side here. So let's try to, if you can see, we've got some valleys or, or galleys that are traveling from the bottom of our crankcase all the way up in our, our valve cover area. But what we're gonna do here is our PCV valve is going to allow uh, some fresh air to almost act like as a venturi to help suck blow-by gases in to the intake. 
So we are essentially rotating those gases from the crankcase into our intake to re-burn them. Uh, now that I did mention what emission was in those blow by gases, they do contain some fuel uh, and the crankcase gets hot and when the fuel vaporizes, we get excess hydrocarbons. And so the PCV system cuts down on blow by gases or relieves those blow by gas pressures and in doing so helps contain HC emissions. Again, like I said, because it's releasing that pressure, it increases engine life. The next one is EGR, also known as exhaust gas recirculation. So this one is a little bit different. So the last one was to help limit HCs. This one is to help limit NOx or ox oxides of nitrogen. Now I did mention that oxides of nitrogen are from high combustion temperatures and pressures, right? So we're looking at high heat. So in order to say combat that, we need to cool the cylinder down. Okay, so that's what our EGR system does. It helps cool the cylinder down. How? Okay, so this is gonna blow your mind. What we do is we take exhaust gases and recirculate them back into our intake. Okay, how does that lower our combustion temperatures? That doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't that make it hotter, right? Because exhaust gas is super, super hot. So to put that back, in the combustion chamber, that would only make it hotter, right? No. Remember that term I was talking about earlier, inert? It's non-reactive. So if exhaust gases are from combustion or the, the aftermath of combustion, that means we've already blown up those gases. So exhaust gases are inert, generally inert gases, meaning they've already blown up. They can't blow up again, bro. They've already blown up. So if I fill my cylinder partially with exhaust gases that can't blow up again, and let's say half the cylinder gets filled on the intake with exhaust gases, while the other half of the cylinder gets filled with our regular air fuel mixture, only half of the volume of that cylinder is being used, therefore lowering combustion temperatures. <sighs> Crazy, right? Um, and so in doing so, we reduce our oxides of nitrogen emissions. Now there's two types of systems. Older systems were vacuum operated. Uh, newer systems are electronically operated by the PCM. <coughs> Excuse me. Newer, uh, newer systems are operated by the PCM, but even newer systems are going away from an EGR system. If you can manipulate your exhaust gases um, or, or I'm sorry, if you can manipulate your valve timing and you leave your exhaust valve open a tad longer on the intake stroke, so exhaust stroke happens, right, piston moves up, the exhaust valve is open. What if when the piston starts to move down on intake, the exhaust valve just never closes uh, until maybe halfway through down the stroke? That's what a lot of newer uh, vehicle manufacturers are doing. They're utilizing variable valve timing to leave the exhaust valve open longer to suck exhaust gases back in, rather than have a whole EGR setup, having to have all these extra components. If you already have variable valve timing, then you can eliminate EGR and do the same thing. Fill the cylinder with inert exhaust gases to lower cylinder temperatures. Um, and so we are seeing a little less and less of this as uh, vehicle manufacturers make new stuff. So on the left here, we've got an EGR valve that is computer controlled, right? Over here on the right, we've got a vacuum valve uh, with a vacuum part to the intake manifold. Again, both do the same exact thing. They are meant to either block or allow exhaust gases into our intake manifold. Now an older system, much older, uh, is going to be a TAC, also known as thermostatic air cleaner. This one is gonna be designed to heat intake air when the engine is cold. So uh, what's really important to know is in this system, we are not uh, taking exhaust gases and routing them into the intake, that's EGR. We are taking air from around the exhaust pipe they call this portion a stove. 
and we're gonna take that hot air, it's not exhaust, it's just hot air from around the exhaust, and we're gonna reroute that into the air cleaner. Now, here's why we did this. First off, they really only needed to do this on carbureted vehicles because any type of electronic fuel injection doesn't need to do this because it can electronically limit the amount of fuel it puts in. But on a carbureted vehicle, everything is limited mechanically. Um, and when the engine is cold, uh, a lot of you may know that uh, if, you, if you've driven an old car, you have to turn on the choke, right? Cold engines are going to, first off, already, already require more fuel. Uh, but the problem is, is if I have a cold engine with cold air, cool temperatures make things want to condense, right? We see this in a lot of uh, different things in life. But in this particular situation, we're worried about our fuel condensing into big droplets. We don't want that. Remember, fuel atomization is key to efficiency. And so if we are able to atomize our fuel better, then we don't need to dump so much fuel. So in carbureted systems, the air was cold, the engine was cold when you first started up the vehicle. So when it would dump fuel and air, the cold temperature would make that fuel want to puddle up and you would get waste fuel that would puddle in the bottom of your intake manifold. So then you would have to dump even more fuel to keep the engine running. And so you're wasting lots and lots of fuel, right? So what the thermostatic air cleaner did is it heated up intake air to help the fuel vaporize before it made it into the cylinder. And so we didn't have all that waste fuel in the intake manifold. But since we now use uh, fuel injection, we can limit the fuel injection and atomize it uh, quite a bit better. Your thermostatic air cleaner was vacuum operated uh, and its job was to reduce HC and CO emissions. But again, only when the engine was cold, it didn't need it when it was hot. Now to do the same exact thing, uh, we have another type of system called an EFE. There's two types of EFEs. I'll, I'll explain the heat riser first. First off, EFE stands for early fuel evaporation. Um, and this one, I, like I said, same thing, it's designed is to heat the intake air when uh, the engine is cold to help the fuel vaporize. In the heat riser system, we divert exhaust gases under the intake plenum. So here is a valve um, in our exhaust that has a sort of thermostat, uh, 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 a bimetallic thermostatic switch here with a counterweight on it. And that butterfly would open either closing or allowing exhaust gases to go to the intake. Again, we're not dumping exhaust gases into the intake air. We're just putting it under the plenum to heat up the intake air from the bottom. They are not intermingling. Same exact thing, we're reducing HC and CO, a newer system. Uh, again, we really only need these on carbureted vehicles. Uh, this one is a heater grid setup. So this one is electronic and air would go through this hot heater grid and it would heat up again to help the fuel vaporize in the intake and again, reducing HC and CO emissions. Now, new computer controlled vehicles, electronic fuel injection, um, all this stuff has helped us immensely. So the spark control system, also known as your ignition system, if it's computer controlled, then it is helping you uh, run cleaner. So we can utilize our ignition timing to reduce, if we do it correctly, to reduce all three emissions, HCCO and uh, oxides of nitrogen, um, in this particular system, most of them are going to use some sort of knock sensor, like I, I, if you follow my mouse here, like I mentioned in the engine management uh, uh, lecture last week, the knock sensor is going to let the PCM know when it starts to hear a frequency from pinging, and then it will retard ignition timing. And remember, ignition timing wants to be more advanced, 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 and then when it hears pinging, it will, um, it will take it back again. So our ignition timing, this really should say ignition timing, is going to help us clean up our emissions. And then of course, our electronic fuel injection systems. So we don't need uh, thermostatic or heated air cleaners at all uh, because our EFI systems, first off, port fuel injection and gasoline direct injection um, don't have that uh, 
that condensing of the fuel problem because they inject right above the cylinder or right into the cylinder. And so we remove the need to heat and take air to vaporize the fuel. Um, and we are able to, through a feedback system, know if we've used too much fuel or too little fuel, and we can try to make corrections as the system goes along. We talked a lot more about this last week. Um, so the EFI system is going to help us reduce all of three emissions as well. Post-combustion controls are cleaning up the mess, the mess after we already made it, right? The one most of you guys know is a catalytic converter, not a Cadillac converter, catalytic converter. It is a catalyst. Now, new modern catalytic converters are designed to clean up all three emissions, HCCO and NOx, especially in states uh, like California and New York and things like that where we are highly populated. Um, different states have a little bit of a lower regulation, but all new vehicles, uh, their catalytic converters are going to help clean up HCCO and NOx. Uh, when I say some, I really mean most. Now, these catalytic converters that do all of those things are going to contain rare metals because that's how they do their job. So platinum, palladium, rhodium are going to be the active metals that are helping us do this. Now, cats uh, or catalytic converters can uh, come in one of two categories, either a two-way catalyst or a three-way catalyst. The two-way catalyst, this is on older model vehicles. In fact, you can't even buy a new two-way cat in California. If you have an older vehicle that takes a two-way cat and you need one uh, to pass smog, you generally need to buy it out of state. This one had a honeycomb inside. It looks like a honeycomb, and air would travel through this honeycomb. Um, but this honeycomb is not called a honeycomb in industry. We call it an oxidation bed uh, in this case. Now, the two-way catalytic converters only had one bed, um, an oxidation bed, and it oxidized HCs and COs, meaning uh, it added more oxygen to them. So it took HC, uh, and what, what we're really doing is we're taking these metals and we're getting them really, really hot. And we're also getting some secondary combustion here, but these metals are also helping us separate these molecules. So through our oxidation bed, notice the HCs come out, and there's no HCs here. We've got H2O and CO2. So inside our oxidation bed, we are separating our hydrogen and our carbon molecules and we are taking our CO, and what we're doing is we're taking the excess oxygen and we're adding onto it. Uh, so we're also taking oxygen and adding to our, our hydrogen as well. So we're turning our HC into H2O and we're turning our CO into CO2. And notice there is air coming in through here. We'll talk about that later. Three-way catalyst, um, which is going to be legal anywhere, especially California and states like that. Um, these are going to be also found in all new modern vehicles, are going to have two beds, but they're called three-way catalytic converters because they oxidize and reduce three uh, emissions. So like I said, we call this a dual bed design. We're already familiar with the oxidation bed, but the other bed is what we call a reduction bed. So the oxidation bed takes care of HC and CO. We just looked at that, right? The other bed is the reduction bed that reduces NOx. What we are generally going to do is we're going to use special metals to separate our nitrogen and our oxygen, and we're going to utilize those extra oxygen molecules to attach to something else. So it turns from something harmful like CO to something like CO2 or H2O. Um, and I am going to just go back here a slide just to show you in real life, they are in your exhaust. You may have uh, two of them. You can have an upstream and a downstream cat. Um, you can, if it's a V-style engine, you're going to have one cat on each side. Um, there are systems where you'll have sort of a Y pipe that goes to one single cat, but that's pretty rare. Um, and it looks sort of like this right here. It looks like a big, maybe can. I don't know. Um, and we're going to have an O2 sensor before it. We call that upstream. That's going to tell the computer if the engine's mixture, air fuel mixture was rich or lean. And then we're going to have an O2 sensor after that catalytic converter that is going to be called a downstream O2 or, 
or air fuel ratio sensor. And that downstream is not checking the air fuel mixture, it's checking how much our uh, catalytic converter is cleaning up. So let's go ahead and go to the next one, which is secondary air injection. Not all vehicles have this, but a lot do. Um, we don't see this a whole lot anymore because uh, engines are a lot cleaner and we don't need this. Um, our secondary air injection systems are designed to inject air into the exhaust. That's silly, right? Haven't we already done uh, the damage? Yes, so what we're gonna do here um, is use air, fresh, clean air going into the exhaust. And if we inject it in certain areas, we can get desired results. Older secondary air injection systems used them upstream, meaning that the extra oxygen and nitrogen coming in with the emissions can create uh, with heat, and, and enough heat, right? If we're talking like 4,000 degrees, and I've got oxygen coming in, if I have excess HCs, they're gonna blow up again. And I'm gonna get secondary combustion, which is going to help clean up some of those HCs and COs. Uh, but the problem is, is you know, you get backfires and things like that. Now, if we inject it downstream, mean, meaning right in front of the catalytic converter, we are injecting more oxygen to help out the catalytic converter oxidize and all that good stuff. Um, so our secondary air injection in both ways are going to reduce HC and CO. Evaporative controls, which is the last one, is actually pretty basic. We are simply controlling those HC fuel vapor emissions that we don't want coming out of uh, where we store our gasoline or anywhere else in the system. So this system captures the hydrocarbons from the fuel that we put in our gas tank. And as that fuel evaporates, we need to put it somewhere, right? For storage. Say when your car is off and it's hot, that fuel in your tank is starting to evaporate and we don't want it to escape anywhere else. Um, because evaporative emissions are really easy, probably easier than anything else to escape. And we have them in the vehicle at all times, even with the vehicle off. So what we do is we get those fuel vapors that are coming through um, and are captured in what we call a charcoal canister. Um, it's important that this charcoal canister doesn't get wet with fuel, but it does do a really good job at holding on to all the fuel vapor and it stores it. And when we're ready and we go to start the engine, it will take vacuum from the intake and it will suck all that fuel vapor out and it'll reuse it. So nothing is wasted, right? Everybody's happy. So through a series of hoses and valves and a charcoal canister, we're able to capture all those harmful HCs. Um, and that charcoal canister will generally have some sort of purge valve and that's gonna be controlled by the PCM that's gonna get uh, a signal from somewhere. So uh, there is a monitor for this system. For all your post-combustion controls, there's gonna be a monitor. Uh, and EVAP sort of falls somewhere um, on its own category, so it does have its own monitor. So that is emission controls in a nutshell. I will go ahead and stop share here. Let me know if you guys have any questions at all, post in the comments, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you.